Okay, today I'm going to deal with three chapters from Patrick Deneen's book, Why Liberalism Failed, that have to do with culture, particularly the question of whether we're experiencing a sort of death of culture. I know that sounds scary. It's probably something a lot of you have already thoroughly considered in a way. Um, but the thing about Deneen's approach is he really, again, he lays out all the different reasons in a very cogent way here and gets us to a point where we can really contemplate what's going on. I find that really useful. Some of his um, obvious uh, inspirations in these three chapters, starting with chapter two, um, are Alexis de Tocqueville, Hannah Arendt, Eric Fromm, Robert Nisbet, Wendell Berry, Jacques Ellul, and of course, Leo Strauss. I'm not going to go into these inspirations, but you'll see them throughout. Um, and I've done videos on Wendell Berry, Jacques Ellul, and Leo Strauss. I highly recommend going back and uh, listening to some of those just to give more context for the sort of the intellectual um, background of Deneen. The second chapter is called Uniting Individualism and Statism. We are more or less taught to believe that individual individualism and statism are opposed. That is that the, the bigger the state gets, the, the less room there is for the individual to have freedom and autonomy. But Deneen and the thinkers who inspire him um, make a counterintuitive argument, at least on the surface counterintuitive, that individualism creates statism, or at least a type of individualism creates statism. Hopefully that will be made clearer as we go into some of his reasons. He says that we tend to think in terms of, in this country, at least in America, I should say, um, in terms of conservatives versus progressives. I'm going to use the term progressives for what many people would call liberals um, to kind of clarify who we're talking about. Deneen says this, this opposition between conservatives and progressives that has divided America, especially at this point in time, quite a bit is a false dichotomy. Both of them, he argues, are liberals in the classical sense, and that's why he uses the terms conservative liberals and progressive liberals. He says conservative liberals seek individual liberty and equality through the free market primarily, while progressive liberals seek individual liberty and equality through the, quote, extensive reliance upon the regulatory and judicial powers of the national government. So what they have in common is the priority they place on individual liberty or freedom and equality. So you might ask, what's wrong with that? Sounds good. But statism, he says, and rootless economic universalism, which in the real world translates to globalization, are, he says, products of the quest for individual liberty and equality of both the right and the left. And actually for both, this quest is mainly about economic liberation. It's just a matter of where that liberation comes from. Does it come from the, quote, free market mechanisms, or does it come from um, government which facilitates economic liber liberation? In both cases, Deneen argues that so-called liberation requires, quote, a deliberate and often violent reshaping of local economies most often by elite economic and state actors disrupting and displacing traditional communities and practices. So we've already learned that this quest for liberty and equality is what both left and right uh, liberals have in common. And now we see that they have a common impact. That is that their actions, whether done on behalf of the free market or on the behalf of the interventionist state, have the same effect of, quote, disrupting and displacing traditional communities and practices. So that's what's wrong with that from Deneen's perspective. He gives a few examples, um, very important examples, of this disruption and dislocation of local economies and the cultures that come out of them. Or maybe I should say the cultures that coexist with them or something like that. There's an organic relationship between local economy and culture. He mentions the medieval guilds, and of course, there he's talking about associations of craftsmen with set and enforced standards of production that held together to um, maintain quality and also price 
for their goods, and that level of organization was broken down by um, incipient capitalism and the Industrial Revolution. He also mentions the enclosure movement, and that's a reference to a practice starting in early modernity, where wealthy landowners realized that they could make more money from grazing sheep, for instance, than having um, serfs live on their land, and they started to throw the serfs off and enclose the land for purposes of grazing. And of course, this created a real problem as the serfs or the peasants uh, moved into um, urban areas, uh, packed in without um, employment prospects and no particular plan for accommodating them. They were seen as a problem. Uh, the, they, they were the problem rather than the problem was caused by them their way of life being completely uprooted and disrupted by the economic interests of the, um, the landowning class. He mentions the Luddites, uh, which were English workers from the early 19th century that destroyed machinery um, because they thought that their livelihoods were being replaced by technology. Here we have a picture of a Luddite loom breaker. He also mentions anti-union policies starting especially in the 20th century. Remember when Ronald Reagan started, um, well, he probably didn't start, but he greatly strengthened the process of union busting by the uh, Air Traffic Controllers Union. That whole era of Reagan and, and Thatcher back in the 80s was um, quite a bit about um, how organized labor needed to be done away with to make way for the free market, which would then um, bring more wealth to ordinary working people by giving them more opportunities for employment. But ironically, the price they had to pay was giving up their ability to organize amongst themselves against um, the, you know, the power of um, factory owners and uh, government. He also mentions government support for industrial farming. I've done some videos on on this topic, so I won't go into this too much, but in a lot of various ways, there are many ways in which government, the federal government has definitely supported one type of farming over another, that is industrial farming or big ag. And the um, that has led to a more quantity of food being produced. We all know that because we're to told it constantly, but it has also resulted in a very massive change in the way of life for people in the United States outside of urban areas. Well, there's a lot fewer people outside of urban areas now. Um, small towns are being more or less wiped out. Um, and, and if they exist, their nature is greatly changed by the fact that many people no longer um, own small farms and are less in control of their own um, destinies as a result. And finally, he mentions the various free trade agreements that have promoted economic globalization. Now, on the last two, we can note that both progressives and today's conservatives um, pretty much agree on the goodness of both of those. If you take a look at, for instance, what they, um, what legislators tend to support with their votes. And to Deneen, this is very ironic because in his view, um, surely progressive should be about the working class and people who are not wealthy and uh, the goodness of, of preserving their security and way of life. And surely conservatives ought to be about preserving the institutions such as the family, the neighborhood, the local community, um, in the name of upholding certain traditional values. Um, and ways of life. But I think what we see is while they both talk a good line about values, um, the results of their actions have been pretty much the opposite of what they value. One of the many great things about a book like Deneen's is it encourages us to think about what's actually happened, uh, not what people say. And, and I think that this is harder than it than it seems for us to remember, especially if we watch a lot of um, news, you know, TV news, uh, we get bombarded by words constantly, by, by rhetoric, by political rhetoric, and we begin to think that the rhetoric is the reality um, to the point where, where we'll deny what we're actually experiencing or looking at. 
but we have to realize that reality is what we actually experience and see and live. Um, and we, we need to have more confidence in that. There is one reason he hints at as to why progressives didn't stop this supposed progress. Um, and that is that uh, the type of globalizing economic progress uh, that we're talking about here seems to them to have the effect of wiping out what they deem to be the source of discrimination. That is, they look at so-called thick culture as culture with, you know, uh, that that's about real human ties, uh, close community, staying put. They associate this kind of thick culture with discrimination, and to a certain extent, this is a valid concern because uh, it, thick culture is based upon common culture, and it tends to be promoted uh, best when people have quite a bit in common, and oftentimes that is, um, you know, some sort of ethnic um, commonality or religious commonality. I don't know if it actually has to be that way, but it often is. And so uh, progressives see this, and they're very wary of so-called thick culture. In response to their concerns, I guess we can at least say that it is possible uh, for discrimination to occur even within thin culture, because I think that we see that now. We are living in a thin culture, but but we have uh, in this thin culture a great deal of uh, racism, um, discrimination against people on the basis of religion, um, and, and many other differences. So the fact that we have a thin and fragmented culture has not actually led to a lack of discrimination um, at all. In fact, some people kind of think we're going in the opposite direction here because prejudices and discrimination can be very useful to um, government and economic elites for keeping people divided and keeping their eyes off of other problems such as themselves. Deneen uh, mentions Robert Nisbet, who was a sociologist who in his book, The Quest for Community, Deneen says, quote, saw the rise of fascism and communism as the predictable consequence of the liberal attack upon smaller associations and communities. Well, this is a point that has been made by so many people, I couldn't list them all. Definitely Carl Jung makes the same point. Carl Jung, the father of analytical psychology. If you want to learn more about that, you can do no better than read his book, The Undiscovered Self. Jacques Ellul also made this point. Anybody um, with uh, any sense, writing in the uh, years after World War II, you know, in the late 40s and in the 50s, could see this um, as one of the biggest reasons for fascism and communism. The, quote, liberal attack upon small associations and communities. It leaves people rootless, and then they go looking for some way to rescue themselves for that. from that. It leaves them without a groundedness in their religion, and they go looking for another god. It leaves them feeling precarious, and they want somebody or something to take care of them. And this is what produces uh, the anxiety and the anger that leads to uh, these mass movements. And in chapter 3, which is called Liberalism as Anti-Culture, he says that liberalism Liberal anti-culture rests on three pillars. And this whole page is a quote here, because this was so good I couldn't uh, parse this out anymore. He says, the wholesale conquest of nature. Okay, that's one of the three pillars. The wholesale conquest of nature, which consequently makes nature into an independent object requiring salvation by the notional elimination of humanity. There's a lot to unpack there, but to suffice it to say for now, that um, starting even with the scientific revolution, there was this turn towards the idea that nature was a waste until it was conquered, and that the more that we conquered it, the better off we would be. And human beings took off on that conquest without thinking about the consequences of it or the goals of it. And eventually that conquest got to humanity itself. In other words, we not only look to conquer the natural world, but also um, our own humanity, through our political ideologies, through medical science, um, through technology, but again, without, without overarching um, goals. Okay, second point, liberal anti-culture rests on 
a new experience of time as a pastless present in which the future is a foreign land. In other words, it encourages us to think of ourselves as free and autonomous individuals, and that uproots us. That keeps us from feeling grounded in our past, in the past of our ancestors, our people, our history as a culture. So therefore, we are encouraged to live in the present. The future is a foreign land. It's there to conquer. It's there to create. Um, it isn't a part of a continuity. You know, Edmund Burke basically said that the right way for us to experience life is to think of, a, of ourselves as a part of both the past, the present, and the future in a sort of seamless fabric so that we understood that what happened in the past is partly what made us and affects us, um, and we have agency within that context, and then we also have a responsibility to the future. So he said we have a responsibility to our ancestors, we have a responsibility to our, our progeny. And if we thought of things this way, then we wouldn't uh, be nearly as likely to go about more or less disrupting and destroying things in the name of immediate gratification. Okay, third point. Liberal anti-culture rests on an order that renders place fungible and bereft of definitional meaning. Uh, what he means by that is um, fungibility means interchangeability. He's saying that that liberal anti-culture um, uproots us from place, okay? And place and culture go very much together in his view. But to make this concrete, what we must do in our day is go wherever it takes uh, to make a living. And in fact, making a living, or in the case of... Um, professional class, um, the cultivation, the growth of one's career, takes great precedence over remaining in place. That's extremely revolutionary. It's a, it's a huge change in the way people think. The natural way uh, for somebody like Deneen, somebody like Wendell Berry, um, is for people to think about their family uh, their neighbors, their extended family, the culture that they grew up in first, and be very loath to leave it. Now we have the opposite situation. If you're an up-and-coming person, you, you definitely don't want to stay in your hometown, whatever it is. You want to leave it because by leaving it, you're, you're basically proclaiming that you're pursuing your own self-interest and your, in, in your goals, um, which, which is admirable and should take priority over all these people, places, and things that you're leaving behind. And so he says, quote, these three cornerstones of human experience, nature, time, and place, form the basis of culture. And liberalism's success is premised upon their uprooting and replacement with facsimiles that bear the same names. You replace them, in other words, with something akin to fake culture. And I think this is where a lot of the quest for modern, fragmented identities comes from. A lot of what we try to do is buy our identity. We think about our identity when it comes to what we wear, uh, but it's very individualistic. You know, it's not the uniform of a culture, or if it is, it's a culture that we freely choose and try on as a sort of temporary ornament, but is not something that we feel we must wear. And we're constantly changing our ways of life um, and discovering new things, much of which we have to buy in order to get into. Diet, exercise, meditation, even various religions, they often come with lots of material trappings that you can purchase. Now, recently we had, well, just, just a couple of days ago, we had something it's come to be known as Black Friday. As I understand it, the reason why we call it Black Friday is because it takes until this point in time in November for a lot of businesses to get into the black and they, in other words, to start making a profit after all their expenses and the taxes and so on. And they do this because here comes the holiday season and they throw on these sales and people go absolutely crazy. Deneen calls something like this a shopping holy day. Truly, you have to admit this has become a huge part of our culture, and Christmas has become mainly, for a lot of people, about an, an awful lot of uh, materialistic largesse, which is incredibly sad. 
It is the very opposite of what it's supposed to be about. Oh, and let's mention Valentine's Day. Again, a holiday supposedly about love in which people become very hurt if you don't purchase, if you, if you don't remember it, if you don't purchase the, the items that they want and give them a, a piece of paper worth five or six dollars from the grocery store, blah, blah, blah. Another example of disruption that he discusses is industrial agriculture's destruction of rural communities, which I mentioned briefly before, but I thought this quote was so good, I'm going to read it here, and it resonates with some other work that I've, that I've done in this um, channel. He says, quote, a healthy culture is akin to healthy agriculture. While clearly a form of human artifice, agriculture takes into account local conditions, place, intends to maintain fecundity over generations, time, and so must work with the facts of given nature, not approach nature as an obstacle to attainment of one's unbound appetites. Modern industrial agriculture works on the liberal model that apparent natural limits are to be overcome through short-term solutions whose consequences will be left for future generations." End quote. That's an excellent example of all three of the pillars that he's brought up. In particular, the first one about the conquest of nature. And we see in it the destruction of local culture, local conditions, and a disregard for what he calls fecundity over generations, or what we might call sustainability, the idea that we, we don't do anything that, um, that hurts the, the chances of us continuing to do it in the future so that our children uh, and their children's children are, are just as off, well off, if not better off than we are. This point reminds me of Michael Oakeshott's discussion in his essay, On Being Conservative, which is, I believe, part of a book by the same name. Oakeshott said that without love of our surroundings and our time and place, we're rootless individuals that are self and other destructive. Deneen points out that Thick culture is required to keep people responsible to each other and as citizens to their community. And it's required for what we would call republicanism, uh, a citizenry actively engaged in preservation and beneficial growth because they love what they have and where they have it. I believe republicanism is what uh, Deneen is really after, a revitalization of a truly active citizen a citizenry, very active at the local level, and then because of that uh, love and interest in, in what's going on at the local level is more engaged in the at the national level as well. His fourth chapter is called Technology and the Loss of Liberty, and I don't have too much to say about this because I think this is more familiar territory for a lot of people, but he argues that in the name of progress we allow technology to rule us rather than truly using it as a tool. He says that a thick culture would set principles and priorities first and then develop technology to better supply what is needed by it, whereas a thin culture is too fragmented and confused to clearly set any common principles and priority. He goes back to the uh, dichotomy between ancient and modern political thought developed by Leo Strauss when he talks about how Aristotle understood that political philosophy was, in effect, moral philosophy, and that it was, quote, the master science. But you had to figure out what type of life was best, what was the good life, before you went about developing your technology, whether it was your constitution or whether it was the machinery for making things. Deneen says the American Constitution, this is a quote, the American Constitution is the embodiment of a set of modern principles that sought to overturn ancient teachings and shape a distinctly different modern human. It is a kind of precursor technology, the precondition for the technology that today seems to govern us. So the Constitution as a type of, in, uh, of, of technology, as a sort of master science, but a master science that's designed not to create moral philosophy or the good life, but to free up each individual, supposedly, to do what he or she wants and to free up progress itself. It overturns ancient teachings because it sets aside moral principles as private matters, unsuited for public debate because the rationale went, 
people will fight over those things. We have here a picture of James Madison. You know, he said that we have to put these matters, primarily religion, in his view, into the private sphere because we couldn't, we couldn't have a public debate about it or the moral principles surrounding it uh, because we wouldn't have enough agreement. We've had, we had wars forever in Europe about religion, and all of that is true. But it's also true that we paid a huge, huge price for getting morality um, or questions about the good life completely out or seem, seems to be almost completely out of the public sphere where people could debate them and decide and compromise upon them. So in this last chapter that I'm going to discuss on technology, he leaves us with this notion that we may be growing tired of being lonely, that in effect, the level of individualism that we have leads us, leaves us very vulnerable to the predations of both government and the big economy. And it leaves us lonely because we do not have thick community. Now, it's true that the more we are with others, the more we are burdened because they are sometimes irritating or maybe often irritating and they, they will make real demands upon our uh, ability to do what we want and it will not always feel good, and we will get angry. But however, if we do live in thick community, we are around other people in physical proximity with them. We're not just looking at their pictures and their quotes on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. And that proximity is what it takes for us to know that our fellow human beings are real with pains, struggles, and needs just like us. That's what it takes to know that they're not living ideal lives. And that's what it takes for us to know that we are needed in their lives. It's what it takes to feel solidarity with others. In Deneen's view, there's no substitute for proximity, for being close to others in the same locale. The type of sympathy that we feel for people making an appeal on Facebook or on the internet um, in some other way is very fleeting. It's very superficially emotional. It doesn't require us to say, what can we do? It also doesn't elicit this notion of common humanity for very long. Filling out that $1 donation card at Walgreens or Dillon's isn't gonna make you feel a whole lot of solidarity with your fellow man for very long. Well, I plan to finish up the book next week. Uh, take care, talk to you next time.